to jump right in and get started. Um, I just want to thank you all so much for being here and for tuning into this live. I know that today is super busy and there are so many different activities that we can engage in, but for you all to be here and to hear from the stories of these two incredible environmental activists is just such an honor for me. Um, and I will just briefly introduce myself and kind of what we're trying to do here and then we will jump right into it. So. My name is Haley Thomas. I am 19 years old and I am the CEO and co-founder of the Happy Organization, which works to bring fun and exciting cooking and nutrition classes to kids all over the world, as well as classes on entrepreneurship and activism and getting to make a difference in this world. And this series is a part of our effort to do that because us young people, we can really make an incredible change when we connect to our passions and our world and really bring those things together to impact our community. And uh, so amazing to see you all in the chat. The chat is uh, popping off and we are so excited to see that. Um, but I can't wait to just jump in and introduce to you these two amazing young women. So First, I'd like to introduce you all to Hannah Testa. Um, she is a 17-year-old sustainability advocate, international speaker, and the founder of Hannah for Change, which is an organization dedicated to fighting issues that impact the planet. She's a vegan who enjoys healthy living and loves to share her passion with others. She excels at partnering with businesses and government to influence them to develop more sustainable practices. And she's incredible, has traveled all around the world, uh, receiving numerous honors and awards, including the Teen Earth Day Hero Award by CNN. And this journey for her started from kindergarten where she has utilized her leadership skills to teach and influence others and has truly become a voice for the voiceless. Um, and so I'm so honored to have Hannah here. She's also one of my best friends and <laughs> that's an amazing person all around and uh, so excited to talk with you today. So happy Earth Day, everybody. Thank you so much, Haley, for having both Lily and I here today. And thank you, everybody, for joining today. I'm so excited. Yes. And then we have Lily, Lily Platt. Um, she is a 12-year-old international environmental champion. She's a dedicated global youth ambassador for Plastic Pollution Coalition, uh, How Global, and the Youth Mundus Festival. And just at the age of seven, she started Lily's Plastic Pickup. While walking with her grandfather one day, she saw plastic in the streets. And after looking up the dangers of plastics with him, she was sad to find out about the terrible impact that plastic has on animals. And so she decided it was time for her to take action herself. And one of her biggest goals is to inform the world, including global politicians and policymakers, about the harmful effects of climate change and plastic pollution. She is one of the top 100 influencers tackling plastic pollution in the world and is one of the youngest. And she's also gotten a, how do you say this, a, a Lynch D award? I'm not saying this right because I'm not <laughs> from the Netherlands. <laughs> Uh, just uh, um, it's um called a lyncher, and um, yeah, a lyncher just sort of means a small ribbon because if you hear the word ch in the Dutch language, then that always means something that's small. Okay. Oh wow, there's a little a language lesson for you. So, um, she won this award alongside Greta Thunberg and Anna Dewefor for their environmental work. So, um, Lily has done some incredible things, and we actually all got to be together last year in Rome for the Youth Mundus Festival, where we were just talking about the power that all of us have to make a difference. And today, I'm so grateful that we get to talk about that specifically regarding to our planet Earth, and um, I hope you all are like having good weather where you're able to check everything out, but um, so cool to have Lily tuning in here from the Netherlands, and Hannah is tuning in from Atlanta, Georgia. So um, with that said, let's jump in. So yeah. um, my first question, and you know, either of you can take this first, uh, just explain really how you got started and where your passion from the, for the planet came from and what those first steps were. Um, well, how I sort of started with um, uh, with picking up plastic, and it was I was always passionate for um, uh, for the environment and the creatures that um, that live in that lived in it, and and that was because at a very young age I I just 
I just absolutely not love nature. And when, I, and when I grew up, I really wanted to work with WWF. So that was sort of how I, um, how I grew to love the environment. And also because of my family, we, we have all had sort of a connection with the ocean and with, and with the coast and with the beaches. And, um, and when I saw all of this plastic that was, um, that was just thrown carelessly on the road, I felt something. I felt like the planet was being attacked. I felt like, um, like the planet that I knew, and, 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 when, and when I saw the planet, I thought it was fine, but now I realize that it isn't, and that I had to do something. So when I sort of first started in 2015, um, uh, I um I started to pick up plastic um, um I started to save all of the plastics that I picked up each week and then we line them up into sort of groups so cans go of cans bottles go of bottles etc then we took pictures of those and we posted those on social media so that people would get the message how much plastic I find every single week and then in 2017 it so many people started realizing what the message was or so many people realized um oh my goodness this is how much plastic is in the world wow i didn't know this and so then in 2017 almost so many people came to interview me people wanted to do videos people wanted me to do live interviews people wanted me to come on radio shows it was it was really amazing and i'm so and i'm so thankful for all of those people who supported me and those are the people that actually got me here today and i'm so thankful um Haley, that i'm on here and happy after everyone oh that was amazing thank you so much for sharing how you got started and um, Hannah, if you'd like to share with us. Yeah, of course. So I kind of have a similar beginning as Lily. Um, at a young age, I think I've always just been super passionate about, you know, the planet and other animals, and I love spending time outdoors. Um, but as I got older, I was around the age of 10 when I started learning about all these different issues affecting our planet. Mainly what got my attention was endangered animal species. I was seeing how all these beautiful creatures were being driven to extinction because of humans, whether it was destroying of habitat or poaching um, or pollution. And it broke my heart um, at 10 years old. And I knew I had to do something. I couldn't sit back and watch it all happen and see um, the beautiful planet that I loved growing up was being destroyed. So I started to educate myself. I went online and I found different organizations and I was learning about the projects they were doing and I started educating myself and volunteering with them and as I got uh, more into it, as I started working more, um, I started to create my own projects and my own campaigns and events and that's how I created Hand for Change, my organization. And so for the last seven years, I've been advocating for the planet and speaking up and hopefully inspiring other youth to join us in this fight. No, that's incredible and I think that What's really important to note is that, you know, both of you, you have this passion for the planet that has just come from a place that I think all of us can relate to in a certain way. You know, we live on this planet, we interact with it every day, and there are ways that we can change, you know, our individual actions to support it in supporting us. And I think that's a really cool thing. So my next question is uh, really what has been the most enjoyable part of this journey? Um, what's something that has just been like unexpected fun that you've been able to experience through advocating for the planet. Uh, well, I would say one of the best things about being an activist is probably traveling and meeting such amazing people because I have been to so many different countries such as um, Norway, Canada, Egypt and etc. all because I was an activist and I met such inspiring people and people that have become um, are some of my closest friends including, ha including Hannah and you Hayley so it's, it's just so amazing to, um, uh, to travel everywhere and just meet so many and so many inspirations. And that is honestly one of the one of the best things about being an activist. Yeah, so for me, it's probably that I can give back and have a sense of being able to make a difference, even if I don't get to see it all the time. Um, but also, as Lily said, you know, I've met so many incredible people along the way, and I've made some of my closest friends through activism, people that I can really connect to on a deeper level. And that's just been absolutely incredible to meet so many people from all over the world. 
obviously there are huge benefits to activism, both, you know, for the causes that you're advocating for, but also personally, you get to meet amazing people and, and travel. And this is something that we can do at any age. Um, obviously, Lily and Hannah and are incredible examples of this getting started super early. So all of you in this chat, uh, the things that they do and the ways that they share their voice out in the world, this is something that you can also do. And so when you look at them, uh, don't think of yourself as separate, but this is truly a potential thing that you can also tap into. And you know, your voice matters, the things that you care about matter. And that's really what this discussion is all about. So um, super important, of course, to talk about the fun stuff, but I do wanna know about the challenges that you face and the ways that you've been able to grow through those challenges as an activist. I would say that the biggest challenge that I've, um, that I've had to face is probably negative comments. It's because I get so many negative comments saying, you have to go back to school, you're just a child. Le let the adults handle this. But, but if I don't do something, then who will? Because, um, and what I have learned about all of these messages or, the, or about all of these negative comments is to never listen to them or just don't even bother to read them. Because remember, your voice is the most powerful thing on this planet and you can save the world because it's your future. No one has the right to, uh, to deny your future. And we all have a choice either to care for our planet or um or to destroy it like like all of the past generations before us i I think we should choose the fir the first choice yes, that's amazing, and I appreciate that. I think that um in addition to the amazing work you do, you're also just super positive, and uh we need that, especially now everybody's like at home, so we need to <laughs> feel some happiness and some hope about the future. I appreciate that. Um, Hannah, how have you handled these challenges along the way? Yeah, so I mean, I've definitely gotten negative comments as well. And, you know, it can be upsetting. But uh, one of my favorite mindsets that I try and consider is like, for every negative comment that you see, for people trying to bring you down, I promise there's so many other people trying to lift you up. And so try not to focus all your attention on like those few comments when there's so many other people that are proud of you and want to keep pushing your work. So that's definitely been, you know, a mindset that I try and keep with me. Um, but probably one of my biggest struggles is, um, I guess with my age, like being as a young person, there's a lot of stereotypes or people that don't take me seriously, think I'm not educated enough, um, solely because I'm 17, um, which can be upsetting. You know, if I walk in a room, people think, oh, you know, she's just this little kid. She doesn't really know what she's talking about. And they kind of already, have this set idea of who I am um, before I even open my mouth. But I think the best thing to do is prove them wrong, show them that, you know, you are super passionate and super educated in what you're talking about. And, you know, age really doesn't matter. Absolutely. And um, I think that it's so important for us to all really think about the ways that you know, when we go out in the world, we have a passion, of course, like fear of being judged and, you know, of being uh, misunderstood or being perceived as we don't know enough. That definitely exists. Um, but I think that what's so great is that you all are obviously very educated, very passionate, and you lead with that. And I think that that applies to anything that you care about, whether that's the planet or animals or I don't know, anything that you love. Um, it's important to follow that and not, you know, the voices of the haters. So uh, what do they say? Like, let your haters be your motivators or whatever. So um, as corny as that sounds, it's definitely um, a piece of it. And in terms of thinking of really starting out on this journey, you know, you do have to take that first step. And so I want to touch on two parts of this. Um, you know, how did you take that first step? How did you feel when you did your first speech or your first um, march or, you know, started advocating, started making your own campaigns? What was that feeling? Um, and how do you recommend others really step into the journey of activism, whether that's for the planet or topics they're passionate about? And we'll kick it off with Lily. Okay. Uh, well, how I sort of thought with my first speech and with my first march, I was um, quite nervous because um uh, because this was sort of my first speech at a march and and i was quite nervous but then the rest of me it would um it was saying come on you can do this you have already spoken in front of lots of people you have even spoken in front of cameras so i believe that you can do this and 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 that these people will take you seriously because um 
uh, because you have a voice and um, that we need to use it. And my tips for people who want to start out as activists, I would say is to first um, to study what you would like and um, what you would like to be as an activist because um, because no one is forcing you to become an activist but it, was, but it is always good to know about environmental problems and how to stop them so I would say is to lower your use of single-use plastic to inform as many people as possible about environmental issues uh, and to also tell um, uh, lots of people at your school um, also about uh, about climate change and plastic pollution etc because um, because if we tell um, more children then you can build a, a generation that actually cares for the planet instead of destroys it. Great points of you know of course being your biggest cheerleader but also making sure that education is is possible. Um, all right so Hannah um, let's hear from you and kind of how you took that first step and um, how you were able to overcome any fears around getting started. Yeah, so my first step, as I kind of mentioned earlier, was educating myself and kind of being in quarantine is a great way to start that for all of you guys. We have so much time on our hands. Um, so just educate yourself. And we have such great technology now that it's at our fingertips and you can pretty much find anything online now, um, but definitely find reliable sources as well. Um, but I started off just educating myself, finding great organizations with reliable information to make sure I was not spreading the, <laughs> the wrong info as well. and. I started speaking locally at local events, doing um, fundraisers or documentary screenings, and it was definitely scary at first, and honestly, it still is scary to me today, public speaking. Um, I, I'm, I get very nervous every single time, and it hasn't changed, but um, I think just because I'm super passionate about what I'm talking about, and knowing that even if one person walks away inspired or you know, decides to, you know, make a difference or get involved, that is such a huge impact and you never know who they can inspire and how big of a difference they can make. So that motivates me to keep going, even though my nerves bring me down so much beforehand. Um, but that's kind of how I got started, really locally and really small um, in my community. And it kind of kept growing, getting bigger and bigger as I started expanding. Uh, my projects and campaigns. I think it's so cool that both of you have jumped out of your comfort zone to make a difference and you know often outside of our comfort zone is where the most opportunity to make an impact lies but also in our everyday action. So if you all could just give us like three basic simple things that we can do to um, you know take care of our planet, be more eco-friendly, uh, what would those things be like super simple? All right so Probably my first one would be talking about plastics, kind of evaluate how much single use plastics you probably use like in a week, uh, maybe even a month and kind of take that step back and see like, how many straws do I use? How many plastic bags do I use when I'm shopping? Um, because I realized when I started doing that, I used so much more than I originally thought I did. And then once you kind of do that evaluation, do that little audit of all the trash you use, then find sustainable alternatives to replace those. So take a reusable bag or um, reusable straw or don't use a straw. Um, and if you're going out shopping, we're all, you know, panic shopping. <laughs> um, try and buy items in bulk or in as little packaging as possible. Uh, I think those are great, like, first steps that we can all take. And, um, you know, it just really shows us how much power there is in our individual action. So just think of that, you know, as you're going through your day, what are some ways that you can be more sustainable, starting with breakfast and, you know, ending with dinner or, you know, when things get back to normal, how can you be more sustainable um, out in the world? So those are really great tips. Thank you all. Now to your questions. Um, Hello. Hi. Yes. So uh, I'm Adrian. Uh, so one thing is that, um, uh, just so when you pick up like a plastic trash, like in the beach or like somewhere, yes, it's gonna help, but you come back in like a couple of days, there'll be some more. So yes, it's good to do this. We, we also have to like stop it or yeah, like, cause it will, it will help, yes, but we need a, like, you can come back 50 years later, it'll always be here, like in centuries and everything. Definitely. And there's um, the story of stuff, they have a great analogy that a lot of us like to use in the plastic activism world is that um, let's say if you're at home and you have the tap running and it's overflowing everywhere and it's creating a huge mess all over the floor, 
what's your first reaction? You're not going to grab a mop. You're going to go and turn off the tap. And we have to do the same with plastic. So mop cleanups are great. They are not the ultimate solution. Um, and the best thing to do is stop it from the source, stop using single-use plastics, and work with businesses and governments um, so you have more regulations, so less of it's being produced in the first place. Um, cleanups are definitely helpful, but yeah, they're not going to solve the overall plastic pollution problem. Thank you so much, Adrian, for your question. And where are you tuning in from? Oh, I'm from Paris. Wow. I'm oh. sorry, Paris? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Um, so cool to like, we have a whole global community here. Thank you so much for tuning in. We really, really appreciate it. And amazing question as well. I hope um, you got the answer. Thank you. All right. Um, we've got another live question here. So my name is Jansen. Um, I'm from America. That's what I'm usually from. <laughs> so what my question basically is, yeah, like, what if like metal is like, on top of the mountain, basically, um, and someone left it there to like, um, like do something with it, and it accidentally fell off into the water. So like, uh, can it affect the water or like do something? Oh uh, well, it well if something is left near the water, um, well I would say that it does count as pollution, and and um, exposed metal in the water can be dangerous because it can injure both humans and and animals. And but I am not sure if it does um, affect the water, but it sort of depends on what kind of metal it is. Because if it is mercury, then that could um uh, affect the water supply because that could create make the water toxic and if it is iron then i'm not sure if, but it will still um affect it but not too much but i but i but i will say that it is that that it is still um ocean pollution yeah depending on what the metal is some of them can become pollutants like uh, nickel or lead or mercury and a lot of it comes from like mining uh, and if there's like heavy rain um, and it kind of just washes downstream, uh, that could cause pollution, affect, you know, the waterways, affect uh, the animals and the different plants uh, living in that ecosystem. All right, mm -hmm. we've got another one. Um, well, I'm from Ohio, um, USA, and my question is, how do I make all of the people I've grown up with, who are my friends, care about the environment. They don't care at all, and it's very painful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question, and I can definitely relate. Um, it's hard to make everybody, you know, be as passionate as you are. Um, I wish it was as easy as, you know, it is to make, you know, ourselves as passionate um, to our friends, but I think definitely your close friends will be supportive and try and get involved, but it's, it could be hard to force people, uh, you know, to do things differently, but a lot of it is just education, teaching them, you know, how they can change, but also do it in, um, like, a respectful way. You don't want to, like, force them. You don't want to be, like, rude or make them feel guilty, but be more, like, um, approachable and understanding and showing how they can get involved and make easy choices. Absolutely. So really just educating and leading by example, right? I think um, so many people are just inspired by seeing us, you know, do our best and try our best. And so, um, you know, I think it's great that you want to help your friends understand Amanda and, um, you know, showing examples of how to do that is also really powerful and getting educated together, movie nights, watching um, plastic pollution documentary. <laughs> <laughs> and now you can do it on Zoom too. So yeah, I like that. Change the game. Um, thank you so much for your question and for tuning in, though. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Lily. Hi. Hi. What's your name, age, and where you're coming from? My name's Ethan, and there's there's habitat changing. So I was wondering, how can you stop construction workers and all these these people that are cutting down trees and and, and animals are dying from habitat loss? I was wondering how you can stop them from doing that. So it can be, you can't really stop construction workers because really that's their job and that's 
kind of hard, especially where I live. There's so much development happening all the time. It's really heartbreaking to see you know, them clear cut all these forests to build houses or new developments and things like that. But um, some things you can do, Lily mentioned it a little bit earlier, was palm oil. Um, that's a huge um, contributor to deforestation, especially um, in co countries like Brunei and in Borneo. Um, so it's basically they have to grow uh, these palm trees and they cut them all down. It destroys habitats for uh, thousands and thousands of endangered animal species um, in these beautiful countries. And so palm oil is in a lot of uh, products that we buy. Um, they're in a lot of things like Doritos and Oreos. Um, they're pretty much in almost everything if you check. And um, so one thing you could do is try and convince businesses to stay away from palm oil and not contribute to uh, that business. Um, and another thing is if you want to focus more locally is um, try and work with your local government so that um, they're required to keep some trees in their development so they don't clear cut everything and then plant in more trees later on. Just try and keep some of the trees um, already on the land so that they don't have to completely start over and uh, protect some of the trees already there. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for your question. Um, so sad to wrap up, but these have been amazing questions. Like, awesome. It was, I'm doing this. Um, my name is Joey, and my age is Tucson. What if um, rubber goes into the ocean? Uh, well, I would say that that everything that that anyone will throw on the ground will somehow make its way into the ocean. Because this was my, um, this is sort of my first information on plastic pollution, and this was that it's that anything and that anyone will throw on the ground will somehow make its way into the ocean, and uh, and it will somehow make its way into the ocean either by either by rain, shoot, um. Uh, waterways, riv um, natural rivers, ponds, or sewage, and it might take it a, um, a day, a week, a month, or a year. It'll still make its way into the ocean and into and into the plastic soup. And um, once uh, and once the plastic reaches the ocean, because plastic is made out of fossil fuels, it doesn't it doesn't um, it, it isn't biodegradable, unlike other materials. So it just stays there. It ages and ages and ages, and and the oldest piece of plastic that I've ever found is from 1991, and it was in perfect condition. So it still ages and ages until it can't hold its physical form anymore. So it breaks down into tiny pieces called microplastic, and sometimes even smaller into nanoplastic or even smaller into picoplastic. And because it's so small, plankton and other microorganisms are starting to eat this. And of course, then the circle of life happens. So, um, um, so the fish eat the plankton, then a larger fish eats it, um, eat, uh, eats other fish, and then, and then again the circle of life happens. So, um, so that fish that ends up on our plate that might actually contain pieces of plastic. Cool. Yes, uh, thank you so much for your question. Um, I'm so happy that we got to get some live questions from you all and just oh, want to uh, thank everyone for joining us on Earth Day to learn from these amazing youth climate activists who, um, you know, are, you know, I definitely uh, see each and every one of us in, in these two young ladies because it's possible for us to make a difference, um, you know, starting with everyday actions and they are great examples of that and how far that can go and how many people we can impact by using our voice. So use your voice to stand up for our earth and, and all the things that you're passionate about because you really can make a difference. So thank you all for joining us and we hope to see you on our next Live with Happy session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy birthday, everyone.